Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felden, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felding. Okay, it's good to have everybody back after your coffee break once again, program number three for this afternoon. And again, we'd just like to welcome our television audience and thank you again for all your kind letters, your financial help, your prayers, everything. I've said it over and over how we appreciate your letters. My goodness, what, uh, what a compensation for the ministry. Well, before we go any further, I've been wanting to do this for a long time. We've got two people that are so intrinsic to our ministry. They do all the transcribing for the closed captioning as well as for the books. And the first one over here is Sharon Martin. She's the gal that's usually got the red hair and everybody comments, who's the lady on the front row with the red hair? Well, that's Sharon Martin. And then uh, Jerry Poole is the second one. Where is it? Jerry's back over there. And uh, between uh, Sharon and Jerry, they do the closed captioning. And what made me aware of it, I'll just share this with all of you in television, I just happened to be someplace where the program had the closed captioning, and I just sat, and that's all I watched. And it was letter perfect. I I was just flabbergasted. Most closed captioning, you know, they, they, they make some goofs here and there, but... These two people have just done a fabulous job, and uh, I did. I wanted to give them their due. Okay, now we're on uh, the same verse we've been. I thought we'd do that in half of a program, and here we're going into the third. But anyway, that's the way we teach, and I trust that's what the Lord has blessed. So we're going to come back to Ephesians chapter 2 once again, and uh, we're on that but now that after everything was Jew only and Jew only and the Gentile world was without Christ, without the covenants. But now, on this side of the revelation of the mysteries, verse 13 again, but now, in Christ Jesus, you Gentiles, you and I, who at one time were far off because God was dealing with the covenant people, (coughs) now we're made nigh by the blood of Christ, which, of course, is another reference to the work of the cross. Now let's just carry on here in Ephesians chapter 2 on this side of the but now. For he, Christ, is our peace. That is, that peace with God. Remember Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. God has no controversy with the believer. And if suddenly the Lord should come this afternoon, I've said it over and over and over again, you're not going to come before him shaking in your boots because of some sin. That's all been obliterated. You've been forgiven. All right, and so we have peace with God. We don't have to fear being brought into his presence. All right, so he is the one then, now reading on in verse 14, who hath made both one. Well, who are the both? The Jew and the Gentile. The only two groups of people that Scripture deals with. The Jew and the Gentile. And he has brought them into the one body. All right? And he has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Now, that, of course, was a reference to the temple complex where there was a wall that Gentiles did not dare go beyond. But that's been broken down, and now Jew and Gentile have access. All right, verse 15, having abolished in his flesh. This is all in reference to the cross. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of the two one new Man. Now, we always have to recognize that Israel was so involved with the Mosaic law that that in itself kept them separated from the Gentile world. The Gentile had no concept of living according to the law of Moses. But that law of Moses was such that now come back with me, I think it's to Acts. Come back with me to Acts chapter Fifteen. Boy, I thought for a minute I wasn't going to find it. It's here. Acts 15, 
Verse 8. Now, I guess I should go back to verse 7. Back to verse 7. This is Peter rehearsing his time at the house of Cornelius. And again, I would like to point out that Peter didn't go to the house of Cornelius until after Saul's conversion. And so he was already opening the door now to the revelation of the mystery to the Gentiles. But the Jewish believers, remember, from Jerusalem were still undermining Paul's Gentile congregations by demanding circumcision and keeping the law of Moses. So they had to set up this big meeting in Jerusalem, which is also covered in Galatians 2, in about 51 A.D. That's about, what, 20 years after Pentecost? 22 to be exact? All right, but now Peter is finally recognizing that Paul was right by claiming to be the apostle of the Gentile. All right, Acts 15, verse 7. So when there had been much disputing, arguing over the fact, Paul said, my converts don't have to keep the law. They don't have to be circumcised. And Peter and the Jews at Jerusalem said, yes, they do. Well, they finally settle it, and Peter comes around to Paul's line of thinking. And so Peter rose up and said, men and brethren, you know how a good while ago. Now, from this point in time, it was 12 years already that Peter hadn't said a word he just sort of put it back in the recesses of his memory. But he said, Men and brethren, you know how a good while ago God made choice among us, that is, among the twelve, ruling there from Jerusalem, that the Gentiles, see, here we come, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Now verse 8, And God, who knoweth the hearts, that is, of Jews as well as the house of Cornelius, God who knoweth the heart, bear them witness, giving them, the house of Cornelius, giving them the Holy Spirit, even as he did unto us. Now verse 9. Here comes, and put no difference between us and them, Jew and Gentile, purifying their hearts, not by law keeping, but how? By faith. Now therefore, now this is Peter. Now, therefore, why test God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples or these Gentile believers? Now, watch this. Which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. Well, what does that tell you? The law was a burden. And for the true believer, they couldn't hardly breathe for the yoke that was around their neck. And so Peter is recognizing that it's good riddance to get rid of that yoke that had been on the neck of the Old Testament fathers as well as Peter's generation. So that's what he means when he says, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Well, there's Peter now addressing the Gentiles with regard to the house of Cornelius. All right, come back with me now then to Ephesians chapter 2 again, where Paul now is alluding that same breaking down of that wall of partition between Israel and the Gentile. But the Gentile is not forced into the law-keeping that Israel tried to put upon them. All right, now verse 17. Verse 17 now of Ephesians 2. The same God in verse 16, or the same Christ up in verse 13, the same God came and preached peace to you who were far off and to them that were nigh. Well, now that doesn't need a theological explanation, does it? The Gentiles were the ones that were way out there without any hope. The Jews had always been next to the covenant promises. All right, but now this gospel is going to go to both, Jew and Gentile. All right, now verse 18. For through him, that is, through this Christ who finished the work of the cross, for through him we both... Jew and Gentile, 
have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now, verse 19. We're just going to pursue this to the end of the chapter. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners. Now, remember, what are we referring to? Go back up to verse 12. It's been a half hour now since we talked about it. Let's go back up there, verse 12. This was a lot of the Gentile before Paul came along. That you Gentiles were without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now, see? But now. And I constantly try to tell people... Why do you stay on the front side of the cross? That's not where it's at. You've got to come on this side of the cross. After the death, burial, resurrection, and the shed blood. But oh, they just insist on staying in his earthly ministry, which Paul said he no longer has a thing to do with. Oh, it's just, I can't understand it. I can't comprehend it. Why do they want to stay on the front side of the cross when on this side is where all has been supplied. See? All right, reading on. Verse 20. You're built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself, the chief cornerstone. Now, that again isn't hard to explain. This whole book is the inspired word of God from cover to cover. Does that mean that just because Paul is the apostle of Gentiles, we don't use the rest of it? Of course we do. It's a progressive revelation. And the more you can understand of the Old Testament promises, the easier it is to accept Paul's revelations. It all unfolds just step by step. All right? So we've been built on that of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone of everything. Now verse 21. In whom? In Christ. All the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. Now verse 22, and we're going to chase down some references. In whom you also, now don't forget, who's he writing to? Gentile, you and I, who at that one time had nothing to do with the temple at Jerusalem. We had nothing to do with the law-keeping worship of Israel. All right, now verse 22. In whom you also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit, that is, the Holy Spirit. All right, come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's just see how this all fits so beautifully. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Oh, my goodness. Have to start at verse 10. And again, this is repetition. We touched on these, I think, not too many programs ago. But 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Oh, I guess I should use verse 9, honey. Got it handy? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. I'm sorry, you'll have to cross it out. For we are laborers together... With God, why? Because you are God's husbandry, you are God's building. Now, it's the word building that we're going to look at. Because what did Ephesians say? We are in the habitation of God. Well, what does habitation refer to? The place where you live. See, your dwelling place. All right, now here it comes. Verse 10. According to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder. Now, what does that refer to? Building something, a home, an office building, whatever the case may be. We're talking about building something. All right, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, which is the basis for anything that's going to be worthwhile. You can go back to Jesus' illustration of building on the sand. What good is it? Nothing. The first time the wind and the water comes, away it goes. But the foundation is everything. And that's where we start. 
I, Paul says, have laid the foundation. Others build thereupon. But let every man, that means every one of us, let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. And then verse 11, For other foundation can no man lay that that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, see, Paul isn't claiming to be the foundation. He's the builder who lays it. And then we're going to start building on that foundation, which is Jesus Christ, and, of course, crucified and risen from the dead. All right, now verse 12. Here comes the building products. Now, if any man build upon this foundation as a believer, you've placed your faith in that finished work of the cross, now you're given opportunity to work to build. And here are your materials. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Now, I always like to stop and make a comparison. You take someone who's out there looking for gold, silver, and precious stone. He's out there facing the elements. He's probably climbing the mountains. In fact, we were just rehearsing last night the time we had a lunch with a Mao gold prospector in Colorado. It was a unique experience. But he was up there in old rugged mountains all by himself because that's where you have to go if you're going to get the things that are worthwhile. Now, the other three materials, I always make people smile. <laughs> Sharon knows. I always refer to the little old grade school story of the three pigs. What did they use? The first two. That which was easy. See? Sticks and straw. I wonder sometimes the guy that wrote that story didn't have this in his background. <laughs> but see, that's what most believers are doing. They're just like the three pigs. They're out there just doing what little bit they can, and they think that God's going to be satisfied. No, God expects you to get out there into the mountains and grub out the gold and the silver and the stone, the things that are worthwhile. All right, read on. So every man's work will be made manifest. It's going to be put in the spotlight of his fiery eyes. And the day, the Bema Seat Day, now, we won't be at the great white throne. We're going to be at the judgment seat, the Bema seat. And so the Bema seat day, if I may put it that way, shall declare it. It's going to tell what our rewards are because it shall be revealed by fire. Now, I guess I better show Scripture. Come back with me to Revelation. Keep your hand here in Corinthians. Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. Because you've got to compare Scripture with Scripture. Revelation 19, verse 11, hon. Revelation 19, verse 11. Don't forget what we're here for. At the Bema Seat Judgment, the Lord Jesus is going to examine the works of every believer. Now again, don't forget, that's in eternity. In eternity, there's no time. And so he can examine millions of people in what we would call 10 minutes. Because otherwise you wonder, well, how can he examine every individual believer and still have it all done before the second coming? Okay, here it is. Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven opened. This is the second coming, now remember. I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. But here's what I want you to see. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. Now come back to Corinthians. With these fiery eyes, he is going to penetrate the works of every believer. Now, when those fiery eyes hit wood, hay, and stubble, what's going to happen to it? Up in a puff of smoke, figuratively speaking. But when it hits the gold and silver and precious stone, what will it do? It will just magnify it because heat purifies, if anything. And so that's the whole name of the game as a believer. Are you building on your salvation that which amounts to something? 
Are you putting in gold, silver, and precious stone? Are you making an effort to build? Or are you just going out like the three little pigs, or the two, and pick up straw and sticks and think it suffices? Oh, listen, millions of believers are going to be so disappointed when they come to this judgment seat judgment. And they're going to have remorse, I think, to a degree. I know it's heaven, but nevertheless, why didn't I do more? Why didn't I do more? And so it, this is the admonishment. Get out there and get out the gold and the silver and the precious stone. All right, let's go on. Every man's work shall be made manifest. The day shall declare it. It be revealed by fire. The fire shall test every man's work of what it is. If any man's work abide, can survive the fire, he's going to receive a reward. If he can't, if it's burned, he'll suffer loss of reward. Not salvation, loss of reward. And he himself shall be saved. All right, now here's the verse that brought me back here. Here's the verse. We're building a temple. Verse 16. Know you not that you... Now, he's talking about individual Gentile believers at Corinth. He's talking the same to us. Know you not that you are the temple, the dwelling place of God? Don't you know that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Now, if any man defile the temple of God, that is this body, him God will destroy. Now, listen, you wonder what he's talking about? You smokers out there, what are you doing? Every time you inhale, I always say you're choking the Holy Spirit. He's indwelling you. But not only that, you are destroying your temple. Just had a letter yesterday from a fellow in the last stages of emphysema, having smoked three packs a day all his life. Well, he asked for it, and he admitted that he did. We had a fellow out in our Albuquerque seminar. Remember him, honey? He's running around with a little oxygen tank. And he said, Les, whenever I see kids smoking, he said, I walk, up unto, un, I walk up to them unannounced, and I say, Look, kids, this is where you're headed, carrying that oxygen tank. Well, that's what this verse is saying. If you're going to misuse your physical body, you're going to see the consequences. All right. If any man defile or does damage to the temple of God, which is your body, God will destroy. For the temple of God is holy. Now watch that next few words. Which temple you what? Are. Okay. Go over to chapter 6. Still in 1 Corinthians. Now these things are repeated for a reason. That this is what we have to be aware of that we are building on the foundation of the gospel with works of gold, silver, and precious stone because the Spirit of God is indwelling us. This is His dwelling place today. All right? Chapter 6, verse 19. Know you not that your body is the temple, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body and in your spirit. They both belong to God. All right, I think there's another one in 2 Corinthians. Hope there is. Chapter 6. Second Corinthians, chapter 6. Yeah. Boy, I was almost wondering. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 14. Now this is just as valid for us today as it was for the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers... For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion does light have with darkness? What concord or what agreement does Christ have with Belial? What's a reference to one of the Old Testament idols? 
What part hath he that believeth with an infidel or an unbeliever? Verse 16, what agreement hath the temple of God? Hear that? What's it a reference to? Your physical body. What agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. Been a while since you heard that, hasn't it? But that's what you are. If you're a believer, for you out in television, if you're a believer, you are the dwelling place of God himself in the person, of course, of the Holy Spirit. All right, reading on. For God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now then, verse 17, here's the admonition. Again, you don't hear this much anymore. Wherefore, since you are the temple of the living God, wherefore come out from among them. Who are the them? The infidels of the world, the unbelievers. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and so forth. All right, our time is just about gone, but let's come back for our closing seconds to Ephesians once again to chapter 3. I'm going to take this right in where we were a couple programs back because it's so appropriate. Chapter 3, verse 1 of Ephesians, and then it'll be time to quit. For this cause, what cause? Well, we've just been looking at that as a member of the body of Christ. You're building on the foundation, which is the work of the cross. And as a believer, you are to be building up for reward with gold, silver, and precious stones. You are to be separated from the unbelieving world in your lifestyle and in your everyday behavior because you are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit today. You know, I always say what's not important is the past, but today tomorrow the past you can't do anything about but be ready to show your colors from here on if you haven't before all right so verse one for this cause i paul the prisoner of jesus christ for you gentiles and so the whole afternoon i'm going to be emphasizing this is what happened when God turned from Israel and raised up that other apostle and sent him to the Gentile world. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.